can get started and let people join when they, um, when they can. So welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for Bethany Arts Community's celebration of Black History Month. Today we are so happy to have Joyce Sherrock Cole, Ossetting Village historian and a lifelong Ossetting resident, as well as Kendra Martinez and Donna Chambers, join us as we kick off the month with the opening of our exhibit, Ossetting Black History and Culture, Resilience, Dedication and Excellence. For those of you who are not familiar with Bethany Arts Community, we are a community founded on the belief that the arts have a unique ability to inform and enhance our perception and perspective of the world. And that access to the arts at any age and especially at an early age and to the ability to create without fear will create more generous and caring future generations. With this as a guiding principle and with our galleries, performance space, dance rehearsal studio, artist studios, facilities for visiting artists to stay and work while they're here in residency, we aim to inspire sharing, connection, and collaboration in a culture designed for the benefit of the community and beyond. This exhibit and the events to follow demonstrate this commitment to the community and a phrase our founder David Lyons often uses when he's giving a tour of our facilities. After taking people around throughout the whole building, he looks at them and says, you just need to imagine the possibilities, dream and then tell us what can't we do. Finally, before we begin, I wanna thank Peter Murdoch of Craven Jamaican and the folks at Ossining Innovates for their support of this event and the month long exhibit and activities. So with that, I wanna introduce Joyce Chirac Cole, the first black historian for the village of Ossining, a lifelong village resident whose family has been here in Ossining for 130 years. Joyce, welcome. Thank Would you, you just introduce yourself and, and say a little bit more, introduce everybody to who you are. Sure. Um, thank you, Abby and uh, Bethany Arts community. My name is Joyce Sherrock Cole. I am uh, the village historian. I am also a genealogist. Uh, you'll learn about how that um, played into this exhibit a little later. I have a great passion um, for research and for helping people connect um, with their past, uh, with their community. I think it's very important for um, your rooting and, and learning about yourself. So this was a, a labor of love. Wonderful. I, I can attest to the fact that it was very much a labor of love and, and passion, Joyce. So, so thank you for that. I'm also realizing that um, I should have shared with everybody that if you have questions, um, you can use the Q&A function uh, in the in the tool, and we will um, hopefully have time to answer questions as we go through. So, Joyce, can you tell us a little bit about how this exhibit came about? Yeah. So, this was actually really a couple of years in the making. So, when I when I started doing my own family research, and then became um, the lead researcher of the Little Bird Tea Genealogy Society, uh, founded by Shandi Speller. Um, I started to help people with their history, finding their family history, and it became abundantly clear that there was a void. Um, there was no real documented history in one central place that we can find out about, about the Black community. And people were suffering, um, you know, personally with not being able to find that history. So when I became historian, um, and this is, you know, after the wake of George Floyd and everyone wanted to learn more uh, about the black community, I started to get a lot of questions. Um, what, you know, how long have black people been here? What contributions have they made? And this was coming from black and white people alike. You know, everyone wanted to know. So my work began to just take form in researching that. And if anyone's a genealogist out there, if you go down one rabbit hole, you're down there for a while. And I've been down quite a few rabbit holes and it would lead me to uh, new questions. Uh, so 
when I came to Bethany for my uh, tour <laughs> with you, Abby, David Lyons did say, you know, just imagine the possibilities. And that's how this got started with, you know, David and, and you bringing me on the tour and saying that you would give me a place to showcase uh, uh, the history, the undocumented history of this community of Osning. So that's how it got started. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So you've mentioned, Joyce, um, the role that genealogy and what you do with genealogy has played. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about really how you've used your, your um, you know, genealogy tools to, to bring this to life? Absolutely. So it was um, an invaluable tool, honestly, in doing this because I would be researching one event and you know you're looking at other facts on a page and I would find out something and there's because it's not documented I can't find my way back so as a genealogist I always want to do a family tree on whoever my subject is so what I would do was find out a little bit about the fact find the family and I would build a tree around that family and the reason for that was for me to find someone living that was old enough to still be living that can help me with that fact that I was looking for. Okay, okay. And it was really finding those people living mm -hmm. that um, kind of unlocked, from what I can tell, Joyce, unlocked a little bit of the floodgates. Yeah, um, so what, what happened was, and this is where uh, Donna Chambers <laughs> comes in, um, I would find a fact um, I would research it and I would call Donna and other people. I mean, this is a real community effort. I would call anyone I knew. Um, hey, do you know someone with this last name? Or, I'm trying to hunt down this fact. And they'll be like, oh, I know so-and-so. And so, and you know, and so now we have like five people now on this one fact trying to get me one living person in that family. And sometimes I was bringing information to the family that they didn't even know that they had uh, this clue or this evidence of a fact uh, in their possession. So it was actually pretty cool. So not only was I discovering something for Austin, um, I was discovering something for them. Yeah. Very nice. And, and um, well, since you, since you mentioned, um, this is where Donna comes in. Do you wanna mm -hmm. Joyce share and, and, and maybe Donna say a little bit about kind of why Donna was so important to bringing this exhibit to life? Yeah, I could not have done this without Donna, honestly. Um, Donna was really beating the pavement and, because she knows a lot of people um, and she was able, I know that person and she was getting on the phone and she was tracking down people and getting me photos and uh, oral histories. Cause in the process of this, I was able to get some oral histories down of some elders in our community and I mean, I'm just so excited to do that, to start capturing their voice. So I get to hear this, you know, we get to hear this as a community in their voice. I mean, there's nothing better than that, but Donna honestly really was sniffing things down and getting it to me. So I couldn't have done a lot of stuff without Donna. That's wonderful, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Donna, for, for doing that. What, what's interesting, and I'm gonna kind of That's jump, we, we, we didn't so much talk about, but but doing this kind of mix of the geo, geo, genealogy, excuse me, map, mm -hmm. and then finding living people mm -hmm. was so important because as you've told me, Joyce, multiple times, so much of this history isn't told anywhere. No. Um, it is very, hard when you are learning, even as a child, about history and you don't see a representation of yourself. Um, so, and that is the case for the Black community. When I was talking to the elders, um, they didn't see representations of themselves. And, you know, it was a little heartbreaking because I knew it was for me, but to hear it from my elders and um, even people that are not Black that were asking, you know, I never knew uh, I never knew what the contributions were. This is, it was so, it's so very important to see a representation of yourself in history because we all played a part in it. 
Okay, and, and we are gonna get in a moment to, to a little bit more of the exhibit itself. But before we do that, Joyce, the other thing that you said to me multiple times um, as we were talking about this and you were beginning to put this together was that this is really an exhibit that's about Ossining's history. Yes. You wanna say a little bit about that? Absolutely. So. I am looking at one community right now because it's a commemoration of the black community this month, but we are, we are Austining. Uh, when you see this exhibit, you'll see from the early, early years of the settlers here, we were a part of it. So we are entangled in every fact that you can find down to the banks, <laughs> to the, you know, the commerce, the, the, the entertainment, anything that you find we are in that genre that we took a part in it. So we can't ignore um, a community that has contributed so vastly to, to the history. So this is not just for black history, this is Austin history. So it's important that everyone uh, come or look virtually because this is part of your history. It's just a part of the history for people that don't look exactly like you, but we all are one community. Nicely said, nicely said, thank you. So let's take a moment and if you could, Joyce, just walk people through the room. So if people come to, when people come to Bethany Arts Community in Austin to see the exhibit, what is it that they will see? Um, so when you come in, you're gonna see our early settlers. Um, it, it might be a little jarring for some people. It's gonna be something you might not have known. These settlers came here not on their own. Um, they did not, you know, wasn't their, their, um, their right. They didn't choose to come here. Um, but you're gonna go through and learn a lot. You're gonna walk into at the, there's part two to the early settlers. And it brings me uh, to some wonderful things in there. You're gonna learn some facts about early settlers that you probably didn't know. Uh, the next we're gonna go into the military room uh, and honor those who have sacrificed uh, their life for our freedom. And then we're going to go into the church room and you're just gonna love this because you're gonna be welcomed into that room to the soulful sounds of the Jernigan singers. It's, my, it's one of my favorite parts is hearing that. And uh, walking into the civic room where you, we celebrate the community, but we also have to acknowledge the, the uh, the struggle and uh, the fight that they had to put up in order to uh, assimilate into this community and to be recognized as part of the community and just have the rights that everyone else had. Um, you leave that room and you go into uh, what I call Black Life, um, where it's just a celebration of, of life and we get to see Donna's beautiful quilts and her storytelling through her quilting. And then uh, lastly, well, not lastly, but into the first room and the first room is really important it is the first of the first black person in many genres and many uh, occupations and being the first of anything is is hard but it has particularly um, challenging uh, it's challenging when you're the first black person because you have all eyes on you and they want to see if you're qualified to be in that position and not only that, to Black people, you have them on your shoulders. You know, you're breaking through walls and, and you're making um, an opportunity for others. So it, it's, it is a blessing and a curse at the same time, but these people have done it for us. Um, so we have to pay homage and acknowledge the, the work that they have done. Um, so then you can walk into the hallway and I'm just so proud of, of these Black artists, these young Black artists, Kendra Martinez, just fantastic, um, Cheyenne Bell and Samari Davis, Wadi Jones and my daughter Onike Cole, just, it's, it takes your breath away that they express themselves so beautifully through their art. Um, so that is, that is our tour through, <laughs> through the exhibit. Wonderful. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so that was a, a really fast flyover of what's in the exhibit when you come to Bethany. Let's, let's go back to the start. 
and to the first settler's room. And when we come into the first settler's room, um, well, actually, before we go to the first settler's room, Joyce, you have said several times that people have all sorts of interesting ideas about how the first mm -hmm. Black families came to Ossining. Yes. Do you want to just say a little bit about that? Uh, the, the, the most entertaining one, I'll, I'll say it's entertaining, is that the Black community came here to be close to their incarcerated family members at the prison. That is absolutely not true. <laughs> um, we have been here forever. Um, and that's what you're going to learn when you come in. You're going to learn of the enslavement of 84 um, people in Mount Pleasant, because that's who we were. But you're going to learn that um, those were the first people here in Austin. They did not choose to be here, but they were here. Um, so that is the first introduction. So we're just going to, this is a learning experience. We're going to learn the, the facts. You know, it's, it's just beautiful because now we're going to have a good understanding of a community. So we're not, you know, passing on because these things that were coming to me were coming from elders. So it was passed on. So let's start passing on the proper history. Let's look, you know, so we, it's very important that we, they walk through this and really pay attention. This is not to be an art exhibit, it's a historical exhibit. So I want you to learn. I want you to, to really absorb what you're, what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 I think starting there makes all the rest of what we see that much more powerful. It's a yeah. reminder of the circumstances under which everything else that follows came from, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. So we go from that first entry room and we go to the next space, which is the first settler's room, where we find the MacGyver family. Oh, yeah. And um, mm -hmm. the magical suitcase, I'd like to say. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about um, the, the MacGyver family and really, and, and, and the story of finding what's in that room? Um, so the MacGyver family, MacGyver family is, fantastic. Uh, they have allowed me to go into their archives uh, to research, um, and I'm going to share with you um, what I found, but they allowed me to go into their archives and see some of their, their family history. And in their family history, I found a lot of our history. Like I said, it belongs to everyone. And this is in the early settlers room, they have these gorgeous hand tinted paintings that just bring that early settlers room to life. I mean, it's just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, their family, um, what they have held on to all these years. And when we did some historical digging on this, these were quite expensive. This was a luxury. Um, so it's beautiful. And in the case in front of them, it's, you know, they're, the um, Charles H. McIver's papers. And it's just, it, it is something else to see things in people's handwriting. You feel like you've connected to them and you hear their voice. So when you come and take a look in that case and, and really get to know this family that inside their case, they have given us throughout the exhibit, a key to answering a question that, that's been looming for a very long time in multiple rooms. So this magical suitcase, I wanna put a cape on it because it has been a godsend. Uh, so thank you to the McIver family, Denise McIver, Teddy McIver and Carl McIver for um, allowing us to share in your history. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was it, 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 a nice, wonderful, um, story and an example of why sometimes keeping things for a very long time is really quite quite magical in the in the age of um, you know purging everything um, this is a reminder of how much you can keep in just one powerful suitcase yes. um, so then we go down and we go to the military room mm -hmm. and when we walk into that room there are two photos on the left hand side Right. Can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, besides the fact that we're capturing a moment in time, um, you know, what, what are these pictures and why are they so, um, so important? 
Sure. So this is one. Uh, this picture was taken when these are draftees for World War II. They're going off to the train station. They're going off for enlistment and, and into the war. And what is really um, important for you to know about this picture is I've been researching military history uh, for Black people for a couple of years now. And I've always seen the beginning of this march line. And I've combed everywhere, even in the Osning books, if there's the front of this line. And I never, I could not fathom with the amount of uh, Black people that went to war, why there wasn't a picture. I said, they're, they're absolutely, had, they had to march <laughs> at the same time as their uh, white counterparts. So I couldn't understand why there was no picture. Um, so when I was in that magic suitcase and I was going through it, lo and behold, here it is. Finally, after three years of searching, I see the back of the line. And here we have many uh, black men walking down the street. So this find was um, historical because it has not been around. I have not been able to see the back of this line. Um, people, their families can now see their family and they can see themselves going off to war. It's so much more important than just a picture. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then when we go through the military room, we come to a room that is in the center of so many things. We come to the church room. Yes. So Joyce, you wanna tell us about that and, and uh, some of what we're gonna see when we get there? Yeah, um, so the church room, um, as you said, that is the center of black life, especially when we migrated here during the great migration before, uh, this is where we built our community. This is where we built our strength. Uh, this is where we had our clubs, we had our meetings, we, you know, our worship, everything happened at the church. Every, even some of the civic group meetings were held in the church. Um, so this was, the backbone and the strength of the black community. So when you walk in here, um, the chairs were donated by Star Bethlehem Church. They are original to the first star. Um, Holy Spirit Church was amazing in what they gave uh, to build this, this church. It looks like a church and you get to see all five black churches and, and photographs, historical, current, of all of them. And when you're in there, those soulful Jernigan singers are playing the whole time. Um, but I think Horak Ministries, Holy Spirit Church, Star Bethlehem Church, Full Gospel Tabernacle, and unfortunately, um, St. Matthew's Methodist Church uh, did not make it through. They, they did close down, but we were able to capture that history. So now we have it forever. That's wonderful. And I think, Joyce, you also have um, a picture of a quilt that's in the church. I do. And it was made by Donna Chambers. Um, so I will turn that over to Donna to talk about this beautiful quilt. This picture does absolutely no justice to what she has done here. So, so Donna, do you want to do you want to? Absolutely. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I got to tell you, I can't see the quilt. All I can see is me and you, <laughs> Abby. But I do know the quilt. I made the quilt. I made it for my mother. And it started out as a tribute to my mom and her grandmother. She talked about her grandmother all the time. And um, if you look at the quilt, you know, so it, it was a process. It was, you know, a journey. You know, the quilt started out this way and ended up that way. In the upper left-hand corner, there's a picture of my mother's grandparents, Maud Bowman and John Bowman. And there's also a picture of their four children, Henry, Mary. Mary Bowman was the oldest. She was my um, mother's mother, my grandmother. And then uh, below that is the picture of the Star of Bethlehem the original building at 100, not the original, but the second building, Joyce, at 148, 148 Spring Street. Mm -hmm. 148 Spring Street, I'm sorry. And um, there's one window there that was donated to the church 
by her grandmother. It says M.M. Bowman. And then I know the ladies, I know all of the people's name on the window except for Pastor what was Banks, his name? I think Banks. Banks, yeah. And then below that is my father's grandparents who were early, early settlers in Austin also. And um, their names were Anna Hartwell and Edward Williams. And then I realized um, through my cousin that the church was kind of founded on Christmas Eve. Um, they were worshiping at the First Baptist Church mm -hmm. on North Island Avenue. And um, the, the minister said, you know, go ye and, you know, establish your own church. And it was the Centennial Star. And so the star in the upper right hand corner represents the star of Bethlehem. And then I just decided to put a Christmas tree at the bottom because it was Christmas time to liven up the, the quilt. And, you know, I had to give some beauty to the history. And um, if you look closely, there is a picture of my, my two grandparents and my two grandfathers there. And then my mom says, well, how come you didn't put this one? How come you didn't put that, that one? So in the back of the quilt, there's a pocket where she usually puts special pictures. And it was a joy. She sits there and looks at it all day <laughs> in her office. And my mom is 92 now. So mm -hmm. I think she's one of our elders yeah, and she might be listening. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Donna, so much for, share, for sharing. Thank Thank you. Um, appreciate that. So then, um, Joyce, we have the civic engagement room and we have the room of birth and black life. You mm -hmm. wanna maybe, um, what, what would you like to share? Maybe the, the first black fireman? You, I think you had a story yes. there. So the first black fireman, this was an interesting, um, I think it was an interesting and an important find because even in my research for quite some time, uh, I did read there were decades where black people uh, were fighting with uh, the village to be able to be allowed to join the Austin Fire Department. So when I did my research and found out that they did in fact in 1880s, the late 1880s let a black fireman in, John uh, W. Hoffman Sr. He was, uh, he started out ringing the bell. Um, it was really an interesting story because he lived, he was the sexton to the Trinity Church and he, the bell there was the fire bell. There was no fire the system to alert you. And the village would pay a dollar to whoever would ring the bell first. And because he lived right there, the village was giving him a lot of dollars. Um, so he became the official bell ringer. So he was the first person to know of all the fires in Osning. And then eventually he would respond. Um, he would help respond to fires and when he passed, he was the oldest, uh, one of the oldest people in the New York State Firemen's Association. So I, I thought it was just an incredible find. Um, it was just very important. And he was also, um, he also represented Osning in the Civil War. He had been here that long. Interesting, interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, um, I'm going to, and I know we have a couple of other things. I'm just gonna remind people that if you have questions that you would like um, any of our panelists, you know, Joyce or Donna or Kendra, who will get introduced a little bit more in a few moments, um, I ask that you just use the Q&A function. Um, makes it a lot easier for us to see your questions and answer them. Um, so, so Joyce, I'm actually gonna take one now. So we had a question about, was it unique to have an integrated group marching together at this point in history? And this was a question that came up when we were looking at um, in the military room and looking at the men going off um, uh, to war. So I have, there was some separatism. Um, there was a lot at that time, but in the, when it came to war, when they were going off to war, they went together, they marched together. Um, I don't think, I think at that point when you're looking to leave and not know if you're coming back, um, who you're standing next to walking down the street really didn't make a difference. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, so Joyce. Well, actually, Joyce, unless there's anything else that you absolutely want me to make sure I get in now, I think what I'd like to do is take a few moments and um, we'll talk to Kendra mm -hmm. about her work. Um, and then I got actually a, a question for Donna, which we'll come to. So we'll spend, we'll kind of switch gears here and we'll spend a little bit of time on, on art and the artists. Does that work for you, Joyce? Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. So Kendra. You know, you know, I wanted to say something about the marching off to war. Um, during um, some holiday recently where we posted pictures on the Asning, uh, if you grew up here, you, you came from Osnick um, and there were military pictures. There was, um, my father was in World War II, so he was in the Navy. And I got a post from a gentleman, I don't remember who, who he was, but um, he was a white man and he, he told me to give my mother his best because he marched off to war with my father. So, you know, they all went to high school together that's one thing, the high school wasn't segregated. So they did get to know each other through sports or through social activities. And, you know, there were some mixings, mixers, I would think. What do you say? There, there were even, but um, where there was also some mixing, there was a, there was separate. I mean, that's a, another topic, a whole other one on their own with yeah. some of the oral histories where, you know, we were told that in school, they would hang together, but you know, outside of school hours, you know, may, some might not have been welcome in others' homes. Oh, that's true. Very true. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you, Donna. So, Kendra, uh, 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 as I said to Kendra the other day, <laughs> a name I know well and love. It's my daughter's name. <laughs> Kendra is another, Kendra Martinez is another wonderful, charming young woman. So Kendra, can you introduce yourself to our audience? Oh, hi, I'm Kendra. I'm an artist from, well, I grew up in Ossining. I don't currently live there right now. Right now I live in Poughkeepsie. <laughs> but I was born and raised in Ossining. All of my family's also from Ossining. <laughs> And um, my mom actually went to school with Joyce. That's fun fact. <laughs> it's a small world. And once, once an Ossining, I always an Ossining. I always. So, so Kendra, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started with art? Well, um, I've always loved art. Like it's always been a part of me, like, I want to say since like the first time I ever picked up a pencil or a crayon, whatever. And um, basically, once I once I entered fourth grade, um, my then art teacher, Mr. Whitehead, Ronald Whitehead, I believe that's his first name. But <laughs> um, well, he was my art teacher then, and he had a way of explaining. Um, he had a way of explaining art and showing you the beauty in everything that it just inspired me so much that I wanted to pursue that as a career. And ever since then, I've always loved art and I've um, pretty much tried to explore every avenue of it <laughs> from drawing to painting, instruments, um, cello being my favorite. <laughs> and even at one point in my life, I wanted to be a ballerina because I think that's like, I think, ba I think ballet is like so beautiful and the way that they can tell a story so elegantly through dance is amazing, right? But yeah, so that's that's basically what inspired my desire to be an artist. 
<laughs> All right, so so go, Mr. Whitehead. So, um, <laughs> uh, um, also, I'm just going to ask you before we get to having you kind of share uh, something, a, a, a piece or two that you have in the show here. Um, you have a very sweet story about what what happened that made you decide that you were really going to seriously dedicate your, yourself full time to art. Can you share that? I thought it was just really sweet. <laughs> well, um, so back in 2019, I was working as a pharmacy technician. Absolutely hated that job, <laughs> but I was doing it. And um, I always had this thing where I tell my kids all the time, follow your dreams, do what makes you happy, and I will be there a thousand percent to support you through everything, right? Well, my son, who loves to call me out on everything, he probably doesn't even remember saying this, but my son, he called me out and he told me, he said, how can you tell me to follow my dreams when you don't follow yours? Because this was after him asking me if my dream was to be a pharmacy technician, and I told him no. And he basically called me a hypocrite. <laughs> so after that, um, yeah, I was unhappy where I was with the job I was at. I ended up quitting that job. And I like was thinking about what I kept thinking about what my son said for like a few months. And but then I started, but then I started I, at the same time I was starting to look for other jobs. And then this is one part that I did leave out of that story. I actually did get hired at another job <laughs> during those few months where I was contemplating what I should do with my life after being called out by, by at the time, how old is he now? At the time, seven-year-old. <laughs> so, no, he was eight, I lied. <laughs> so I was contemplating what I should do with my life and I did get hired at another job during that time frame and got fired before I started. <laughs> so that's when I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, well, also with a push for my husband to do it, I decided I'm just gonna go follow what, I'm gonna go follow my dreams and do what I wanna do because how can I really sit here and tell my kids to follow their dreams when I'm not doing it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that's wonderful and i'm going to ask you kendra if maybe joyce if you could show us um respect the drip exactly and kendra can you tell us a little bit about this piece that has um a real spot of honor in the in this show mm -hmm. gladly um okay so that is basically an ode to the way I grew up, the people that surrounded me and the culture and like our culture, right? It, um, ow, my back, sorry. <laughs> it was basically a representation of the music we listened to, this, like our style, our vernacular, um, basically, everything that makes us who we are, right? And I wanted to show it in a way that I guess people would understand and relate to. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful piece, Kendra. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, it really is. So, um, um, and Kendra has uh, other pieces in the exhibit as well. Kendra, do you wanna just take maybe one moment and tell us about Blue Moon? And then I wanna to get to a quilt of Donna's. And then we have a number of questions in the, um, uh, here for us. So can you just tell us briefly about Blue Moon? Okay, so Blue Moon, um, if you know me, then you know I'm a very spiritual person. That being said, um, from a spiritual standpoint, the moon represents feminine energy, right? So blue moon was basically, if you see it, you'll see the, you'll see the 
um, every behind like every female is a moon. So basically it was just a representation of the feminine energy of the moon. Okay, thank if you. you can tech Kendra talk about um, the, the textures. I mean, this is this piece is absolutely stunning. If you can get to Bethany to look at this, I mean, this yeah. picture is doing <laughs> no justice in part. This is stunning. It really is quite stunning. You're, Thank you. you. Yes, you're, you're, you're right. So, um, Kendra, do you want to just, do you want to just tell us really quickly kind of what materials you use for this piece? So, uh, the paint itself is acrylic, but, uh, I also, those like the strips you see on everything though, that's glitter and the moon was very tedious. Those are, those are glass. That's made of like, I glued, I glued the glass on there piece by piece. <laughs> yeah. So that, that took a little while. <laughs> wow. And it get, jo Joyce is right that, 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 you know, seeing it in, in, in real person, <laughs> seeing it um, and, and hung on the hall really does look, in the hallway really does look beautiful. So thank you. Thank you. you. So thank you, Kendra. Donna, I think we have one more of your quilts. Joyce, do we have one more of Donna's quilt? And maybe Donna, if you could talk a little bit about this. And I'm gonna ask, we had a question here um, uh, in the Q&A, which now, so somebody asked, how long does it take Donna to make her quilts? So maybe can you tell us a little bit about this piece and then um, share how you kind of wanted um, to put it together. I wanted to thank and congratulate Kendra. I love her work and keep on keeping on, you know, follow your dream. I've been doing um, art since I was in Austin High School. Uh, but this piece uh, is one of the first quilts I, I've, I've done. I, I started quilting in about uh, maybe 12 years ago. I'm a jeweler by trade, but I used to sew all of my, my life. And um, this piece, uh, it's called Praise Dancing. And uh, it was my first quilt. And I just was looking for bright colors. I didn't have this in my mind. I, the, the fabric just spoke to me and it turned out this way. It's a traditional um, a quilt block that's called a log cabin. The center, the center of each block has the green in it, and it represents, um, you know, if if you were to see some, uh, there's a long quilt in the front of the show, which tells about um, the Underground Railroad, and a log cabin quilt means that there's a safe house coming. But you know, I just used it and I did my thing. I got creative and I put the, the dancers in the center. You know, it was a great experience. It made me keep wanting to quilt. And I thank you, you ladies. Well, Donna, your, your quilts, I saw the, the images, Joyce shared them early on, just, you know, um, images and I thought they're, they're beautiful, but they really, they are, stunning when you see them in in person so Donna one more question for you mm -hmm. um do you make your quilts solo somebody's asking or do you quilt in a group oh I make them solo but I do have a quilt quilt group that I belong to that um is they usually meet in they usually meet in um Katona or Somers at at JFK high school or Kennedy Catholic. And there's about a um, hundred ladies in the quilt group. And, you know, we have all kinds of activities. We have a yearly um, quilt show that's held at uh, Connecticut, Southern Connecticut University in Danbury. And, you know, we have comfort quilt groups where we make quilts for, you know, people in need of love and comfort and they're sad and they just need need something just to to make them feel better so consequently this quilt group fills a lot of voids in my life 
and it helps a lot of others. I mean, during the COVID, it was amazing. Yeah. I just quilted all day. <laughs> Couldn't go any place, just quilted all day. Yeah. Wonderful. And, and we had a, a question here, actually two questions about whether any of Donna's um, quilts are for sale. And yes, in fact, a few of them are. So we encourage you to come on in and take a look. They really are, are spectacular. So thank you, Donna. Thank you. For, thank for you. And opportunity. Sure. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to go through um, Joyce and ask, um, pick a couple of these questions to ask you. We've got some great, great questions here. Um, so somebody has asked how long, how, what tools you use to build a family tree? Um, okay. uh, so when I'm building a family tree, I start with Ancestry.com, FamilySearch.com. I go into vital records and um, it depends. At, so I start at, at start with Ancestry to build it. And then I'm using every available online resource. Um, because of COVID, we can't get into a lot of um, clerk's offices, uh, depending on where I have to search, but I, I use all of those tools. So as a certified genealogical researcher, I, I, I dig pretty deep. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. See, we also have a question. Well, we have somebody who's asked if we can talk a little bit more about the slave history in Ossining. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the comment here is, I think it's always such a surprise to folks in the North that slavery was not just present in the South. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's not always, um, or as they say, you know, it's a, it's a chapter that's erased. So do you, do you want to just tell us, I mean, that, that, th this in and of itself, I think could be an entire, mm -hmm. um, and probably should someday be an entire uh, webinar. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe do you want to just touch a little bit on it, Joyce? Here? Sure. Um, so yes, we had slavery in New York. Uh, we did have slavery here. Um, New York, so the, the North had slavery, but was abolished earlier, but New York was one of the last of the Northern states to abolish it. And we didn't have a complete um, abolishment of slavery. It was a gradual one. It, you know, they didn't want to just, you know, stop it completely. So the end of, I think it was 1797, if I, I have, I'm on little sleep, but I know it's the end of 17. Um, and it was, it took 27 years for them all to be emancipated. So it was like a, um, an algorithm. If you were born after, I think it was 1799, then you, you know, you were free, but if, you know, you had to be indentured for 27 years. So that's why they really say that the slavery was over in New York in 1827, because you had that period of indentured uh, servitude that they had to fulfill in order to be free, to be manumitted. Um, so we did here when we were Mount Pleasant, part of Mount Pleasant, have slaves that were here. Um, we will learn about Slave Ellen. That's a story that you will you will learn coming soon about Slave Ellen. Uh, that was actually stolen from the South and smuggled into Osne. Um, so that is a story coming coming to you about okay. slavery in New York and not just New York here in Osne. Yeah. Wonderful. And I think that, that, that something that Joyce has said is really important. Um, you, you know, this, this exhibit is going to continue to grow um, and there'll be stories added to it in the, in the days and weeks to come. Um, and so uh, we encourage you to, um, to come here, as we've said before, and to see the exhibit in, in person and to watch as those stories emerge. Um, we, we also had a question about, or a comment in question saying the history is incredible. Is there a way that Ossining Public Schools incorporate or plan to incorporate uh, this in their curriculum? So Joyce, do you wanna explain what's going on there real quickly? Yes, yeah, so the Ossining uh, School District has been fantastic. Um, they did reach out and they will be working with myself and Bethany on um, filming the exhibit. Uh, it's gonna take all day, I believe, right? Right, Abby? It's an all day event where they're going to film uh, a walkthrough of the exhibit to make a production that they can pass on to the, the kids for years to come. 
And uh, I'll also, I have made worksheets for some of these facts for children. Um, so they will be getting access to that as well. That's right. wonderful. I think that's, um, that's an important part. Um, so we have uh, um, another question actually about genealogy, Joyce. Mm -hmm. So um, the question is, how does one become a certified genealogy researcher? Um, I went to Boston University um, for genealogical research. Um, it's a very intensive course. Um, I had a few crying moments in that course, uh, but it is well uh, worth it. Um, if you have a passion for just researching and you would like to be a super sleuth and you like to figure things out, then it, this is a, um, a career path that you might enjoy. So you do go to school. Um, I know Boston University has it and there are a few other places. Um, I believe there's not a ton that you can become a certified genealogical researcher. Okay, all right, wonderful. There's also, I'm gonna ask um, just, just one more question here. Somebody's asked about um, the early schools for black students in Ossining and where these schools started by the black church. Do you know, Joyce? Um, I've never heard of that. So someone's about to take me down a rabbit hole to see if something was going on I didn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> But there were uh, neighborhood schools. So you were going to school near your home um, and people were living, uh, you know, in communities for the most part with people that look like them. So you might had some integration, but it might not have been a ton. So you'll see a lot of, um, and I post a lot too, and other listening people, um, when you see the earlier days and you'll see a class picture, you may see only one or two black people in the photograph. Okay, okay. And if um, the individual who's asked that question knows anything themselves about um, schools in, in um, the black church in the early days of Austin, I, I'd say, uh, you know, let, it, let us know, reach out. What I will say about the black church is um, they did a lot to ensure um, further education of black history. When I was looking at this, even early on in the 20s and the 30s, uh, them bringing in hist Black historians to teach the Black community, and they really um, stressed learning it and, and the reason for learning it um, for, you know, self-esteem, for uh, empowerment and, and um, just everything, just to make you better citizens, to make you more proud of who you are and where you come from. Um, there really is, and I say it over and over again, there is power in knowing who you are. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Joyce. So I know that we are coming up on, on an hour. It's hard to believe. Um, we have a, a question about um, just making appointments to see the exhibit. So if you go to our website at bethanyarts.org, um, you'll be able to see that um, and you can, uh, there is an online tool which you can use. We ask that if you're coming in a group that you come kind of with, you know, with, with a group that, um, you know, maybe you reside with or with a, a smaller group. Um, we are uh, following safety protocols here and uh, taking about 10 people total at, um, during a time slot. Um, but you can find all of that information up on bethanyarts.org um, uh, when you go there. And I'm just gonna see, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much we're out of time. The other thing I'm gonna do is encourage everybody to go to the website, bethanyarts.org. We have a um, number of events that are coming up a uh, number of talks, a uh, couple of concerts, mm -hmm. and a class. So I'm just gonna share with everybody really quickly that the next event is next Saturday, February 13th at five o'clock. And this is an artist talk called Table Wizard Spinny Spin and the Separate Five MCs, the untold story of the beginning of Austin hip hop culture with Spencer Thomas. Then on February 19th, we have the Harlem Renaissance, a golden age. It's an online class with Dr. Jill Kiefer. And then on February 20, we have an evening of music and talk with Austin's own Ted Daniel, accomplished trumpeter and um, uh, 
uh, wonderful Austin, Austin resident, excuse me, and then there are three more events to follow after that. So again, we encourage everybody to check out bethanyarts.org, see what those events are, register in advance and um, uh, join us. They are all free. Um, so I'm also going to say though, that we can't do what we do without the generous support and donations from those people who come and see and enjoy what we do here at Bethany. Um, so while you register, if you can take an extra moment and donate, we would be really um, much appreciative. So thank you. Yes. So Donna Chambers, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Kendra Martinez as well, both of you for bringing the walls of Bethany to light with beautiful, beautiful art. Thank and you. Joyce, thank you so much for everything you've done here. Um, I still remember, um, thanks to Dana White, who made the introduction, shout out to, to our former village historian, Dana, who introduced me to you. I remember our first conversation um, and um, I'm so glad that we, that we met and we had that conversation. And I'm so glad that you're so committed to really unearthing this part of our communities. Um, history and telling those stories. And I know putting together your first exhibit was, um, you know, had, there was a lot for all of us <laughs> to learn together. And I just, I, I thank you and appreciate everything you've done to make this exhibit ha happen. So thank you. And thank you before we leave to you and Bonnie. Oh my gosh, you have halos on your head. I just have to tell everyone. <laughs> And Donna, I really just couldn't, and your, your husband, David, and David and my husband is just amazing. And I just want to say to the Austin community, thank you for stepping up. It was thank just you. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and we hope to see you here at Bethany Arts Community soon. Bye. Yes. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>